Welcome to Conjuncture. My name is Jordan Camp. I'm really delighted to be here with Christina Hatterton. She's the Elting Associate Professor of American Studies and Human Rights and the co-director with myself of the Social Justice Initiative at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. She's also the co-producer of Conjuncture. She's the co-editor of Policing the Planet, Why the Policing Crisis Led to Black Lives Matter, published by Verso. She's the editor of many works of popular education, and her writing appears in places like American Quarterly, City, and the Cambridge History of America and the World. In her new book, Arise, Global Radicalism in the Era of the Mexican Revolution, published by the University of California Press, she examines the relationship between internationalism and the internationalization of capital. She traces the paths of revolutionaries like Ricardo Flores Magón, African-American artist Elizabeth Catlett, as well as anti-colonial activist Emin Roy to better understand the making of internationalism. I'm really delighted to speak with her today about her new book, Arise, about her spatial analysis of the history of capital and about the social history of revolution. So thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me. <laughs> Glad to be here. I really appreciate it, Christina. So your book's a global history of revolution. It covers not only the Mexican revolution, but also the Haitian revolution, the Russian revolution, global revolutions, all throughout this decisive period. But it starts with a story of a rope. I wonder if you could tell us why. Sure. Well, the challenge of telling a story about revolution is that you're introducing people to uh, a history they think they already know. So in an effort to kind of defamiliarize the familiar, I tried to tell the story, I tried to open the story uh, with the making of a lynch rope at the turn of the 20th century. And so to do that, I, I first tell this story that's kind of like a typical commodity chain story, right? What are the different fibers that go into uh, making a rope, right? You have uh, cotton from Jim Crow sharecropping regimes. You have hemp uh, from, you know, different parts of the world. But the, but the biggest uh, component of rope at the turn of the century was, some, was a fiber called abaca, or what people in the Philippines called manila. Uh, this was such a dominant component that um, in a lot of articles about lynchings in the late 19th century, Manila is synonymous with rope. So what's interesting about uh, this is, you know, this is also the period of the Philippine-American War. The U.S. gains control over Manila because of the war, but at the same time, the resistance of Filipino insurgents makes the supply of the Manila fibers imperiled. So what's really interesting is around the same period, the U.S. starts turning its attention to southern Mexico, the state of Yucatan, where they produce a fiber called henequen or sisal. It's a, it's a relative of the agave plant. Um, and uh, it's primarily used to bind bushels of uh, grain and hay, um, but it's also twined with other fibers to make a rope. Uh, and what's interesting is who's doing the harvesting in Mexico? Well, it's, it's Mexican peasants, it's indentured Mexican people. It's also indigenous Huastec and Yaqui Indians that are being captured from around the country. Um, they also bring in a number of indentured workers from around the world, from Java, the Canary Islands, China, 3,000 workers from Korea. So you see that the, the making of these fibers is themselves an international story. Uh, and, you know, as I say in the book, there are these kind of curious composites of coexisting regimes of accumulation globally. I just wanted to give the reader a kind of sense of like, look, here's the world already kind of intertwined. But the intro is not just a commodity chain story. It's a story of resistance. So, you know, famously, the conditions in Mexico were so bad that a number of U.S. writers talked about it in terms of slavery. And the McCormick Harvesting Company, which owned a huge share, they become international harvester, they own a huge share of the Hennequin trade in Mexico. They write this article and they said, uh, you know, there is, uh, there's no slavery, uh, you know, in the harvesting of Hennequin and Sissel in Mexico. All the workers are paid, uh, you know, on time and equally. And this is, of course, ironic 
because it's against the McCormick Company in Chicago where the Reaper binder technology is made, the, 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 the machinery that actually binds, that, that uses the Hennequin, the Mexican Hennequin rope to bind bales of hay. This is where the famous Haymarket strike happens. You know, uh, the Knights of Labor call for a general strike. Workers go on strike in Chicago. They famously strike the McCormick factory. Two of the workers are killed in the strike. Everybody gathers in Haymarket Square. Why is it called Haymarket? Because this is where they sold the bundled hay. Uh, you know, they gather there, a bomb goes off, the police fire into the crowd, you know, uh, the dust settles, people are dead, and they charge these labor activists who they wanted to put a clamp down on before. Uh, they charge them with conspiracy and murder. And, uh, you know, what's so fascinating is this is obviously where May Day comes from. In Mexico, this is called Day of the Martyrs of Chicago. And when Mother Jones uh, from Chicago, famous labor organizer, goes there in 1921, there's this big labor uh, solidarity demonstration and uh, the Mexican workers come out with a big banner uh, in honor of the martyrs of Chicago. And um, she says this is the most uh, incredible demonstration of worker solidarity she'd ever seen in her very long and esteemed career as a labor organizer. So, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, I think what I'm trying to do in this opening chapter is to be able to show you, like, look, let's have some attendance to how uh, the world is being pulled together, twined together, woven together with something tangible that we can see, that we know the effects of. How do we think about the history of lynching, but think about it already in an international context, but also by unraveling that rope, unraveling the strands, understanding you know, how each of those regimes of accumulation are produced, we understand the world in struggle. So this is kind of like the encapsulation of my argument about the internationalization produces an internationalist consciousness. I just needed the reader to come in, you know, and be able to hold on to something. Uh, and so every chapter of the book is about the making of something, how to make a university, how to make a flag, how to make love, and the introduction is called How to Make a Rope. Well, thanks for this, Christina. And I also wanted to ask you about the title, uh, Arise. I wonder if you could Tell us why Arise and also why global radicalism and why in the era of the Mexican Revolution? Okay, all right. Well, that's three easy parts, so I'll take them in that order. Arise, of course, is the first word of the anthem, the Internationale, the anthem to internationalism. Um, but what people don't know is that it was a poem written after defeat. In 1871, a, trans, a French transport worker who was also an artist named Eugene Poitier, he wrote a poem. Uh, arise ye starvelings from ye slumbers. I'm, I'm butchering that. Uh, and the poem was written um, after the slaughter of the Paris Commune. So Poitier saw, you know, 30,000 Paris communards, uh, you know, workers who had tried to establish a temporary worker state in Paris, slaughtered by the French military. People at the time recognized that this was kind of chickens coming home to roost. You know, the French military had participated in similar massacres in Senegal, in Algeria, in Mexico. So this was a, a, the smashing of the commune was an iteration of that same kind of violence. So Poitier writes this poem. It gets put to uh, music by a Belgian worker and composer in 1888. So, you know, I mean, it's, that's, that's where it comes from, but why did I call the book it? Well, you know, the song came up everywhere. The song came up everywhere. I was researching strikes where workers didn't speak the same language, but they can all sing the song. Funerals where people from different countries, from different affiliations, uh, you know, this is, this is their common language. In uh, Leavenworth Penitentiary, where I tell the story of all these global radicals coming together, this is the, the kind of lingua franca. And what's extraordinary about it is it's, it's revolutionaries, it's global radicals from any number of traditions. They're communists, they're anarchists, they're pacifists, they're nationalists, they're revolutionary nationalists, right? So, I mean, today you'd think they'd have nothing in common, but they could all sing this song. So I, it just like followed me. And as I was writing, I would also listen to different versions of the song. So I was really interested. It's recorded in different languages. People have tried to revise the song. And I think that there's this kind of effort to reimagine 
uh, a common language. What, you know, internationalism at present, uh, you know, the DJ Charles Leonard in Johannesburg, South Africa sent me a version, you know, a new version from South Africa. So, you know, I, I, I think that this is a really interesting um, effort. It's, it poses an interesting question. Uh, David McNally writes in an essay that the challenge of social movements at present is that unlike the social movements of the 20th century, we do not have a common language, right? So this effort to like, you know, think about what would that look like now, I feel like requires going back and thinking about how it was constructed before and also kind of like uh, eliminating some of the, the shibboleths, some of the kind of baggage that the history of internationalism has. So, you know, what's interesting about using it as, it, as the title of a book is there's a really, uh, I, I think, proud tradition of people plumbing the lyrics of the song in order to write a different study. Uh, Melvin Dubofsky, you know, writes, We Shall Be All, A History of the Anarcho-Syndicalist Industrial Workers of the World. Franz Fanon, Wretched of the Earth. I think people don't realize that's the second lyric of the song, right? Arise ye wretched of the earth. Uh, Dorothy Healy, after she left the Communist Party, uh, says to her, the uh, Maurice Isherman who, who interviews her, that if she could write a memoir, it would be called Traditions Chains Have Bound Us. Uh, because she says, you know, revolutionary movements have to be constantly interrogating themselves. They have to be constantly rethinking the traditions that they're a part of. As soon as you settle into economism or dogmatism, it's no longer a revolutionary movement. So, you know, each of these different studies grapple with the legacy of internationalism for the moment they're in. That's what I wanted to do, so I, you know, uh, ostentatiously took the first word from the song and called the book Arise, what displaces are commonly um, held ideas of internationalism and revolution uh, that instead of starting with the Russian Revolution, starting with the first major social revolution of the 20th century, which happened in Mexico? Thanks for this, Christina. You know, it makes me think of Marx's observation in the Brumaire, you know, criticizing uh, those who were dressed in costumes of past revolutions, the critique of nostalgia, if, if you like, and he argues instead for drawing, uh, you know, revolutionaries drawing their poetry from the future. And I wanted to ask you about uh, your argument about the history of revolutionary internationalism being significant for understanding this globalized resistance to what you call following W.B. Du Bois as the era of the new imperialism. And interestingly, you put Du Bois in dialogue with the political economist Giovanni Arrighi to better understand how this took shape amidst the consolidation of U.S. hegemony in this period. So can you talk about this argument and what are the political stakes in making it in the way that you do? Sure. You know, another really rich metaphor in that book book of very rich metaphors, the 18th Brumaire, that Marx uses is uh, he talks about the regime of Louis Bonaparte as a shadow with no body. And I think this, con this concept of shadow is really rich for me. So in the book, I talk about shadow hegemony. I, I try to think about U.S. hegemony uh, as shadow hegemony. And this is for multiple reasons. I want to be able to... Um, in the way of uh, Giovanni Arrighi and Beverly Silver talk about, I, I, I want to think about how they were in the shadow of British hegemony, right? Uh, you know, uh, one of the first places that the U.S. Um, uh, operates as a creditor to another nation is in Mexico, right? Uh, and there's a lot of uh, writing about how this is... Um, you know, under the tutelage of the British. So let me let me back up and just say this. After the financial crisis of 2008, I heard an economist make a really interesting offhand comment. He said, you know, capitalism's in trouble when people start calling it by its name instead of using euphemisms like the global market, the market, globalization, right? And what we've seen since then is, ha has been this plethora of new types of studies about capitalism. There was a history of capitalism. People are talking about racial capitalism now. What I think Origi helps us do is think 
a little bit more concretely about different, he calls them systemic cycles of capital accumulation that are dominated by different hegemons. And I think he helps us prevent, uh, he helps us avoid the era of error of talking about capitalism as if it's a trans historic entity, as if it operates the same way in every place and time. And, uh, you know, um, that there's no contingency, which I'll talk about in a second. So um, what I was really interested in is just kind of giving a name to this period, which I'm broadly calling the era of uh, new imperialism after Du Bois, right? Du Bois gives us this language to be able to say there's something significant happening to the global capitalist system in the mid to late uh, 19th century, right? Uh, you know. By 1848, there's a massive expansion of the capitalist system. And by the turn of the century, Du Bois notes that there is something fundamentally different happening. He describes it in an article, uh, The African Roots of War, uh, as a new imperialism. But what he, de he describes as a democratic despotism, right? And he says, in order to try to harmonize the interests of capital and labor, there's this new sensibility which he's describing as the color line, the institution of this logic that uh, the white working man, broadly defined globally, uh, is asked to share the spoils of the imperial gains in you know different imperial ventures. And so, you know, in writing about Mexico, uh, in writing about the Philippines, in writing about Haiti, in all these different writings in this period, Du Bois is saying, you know, there's something really rotten here where the color line appears to pay dividends, that there's a way in which the interests of financiers who are expanding their power at this moment are successfully representing this minority interest as the general interest. And what's critical to that hegemonic move is this, uh, is the color line, is this false idea uh, that people, um, uh, you know, benefit from racism, from imperialism, from colonialism. So Du Bois intrinsically understands that this is, uh, you know, this is a this is a trick. And so, in order to um, let me say it this way, Beverly Silver, who was Giovanni Arrighi's partner, longtime collaborator, and co-author, you know, makes a really kind of um, helpful. Uh, uh, addition to a Rees theory of systemic cycles of accumulation, where she says, you know, you can't think about capitalism as an organism, right? Its growth, its development it's con is contingent. And what is it contingent on? Class struggle. When people fight back, when people make different regimes of accumulation impossible, or they slow it down, or they produce friction, and worst of all, if they build solidarity across seemingly disparate, uh, dis discrete spaces, uh, to halt it in its tracks. So, you know, what I'm doing with the Rigi and Du Bois is trying to articulate that relation. First of all, to say that capital doesn't operate the same way in every place and time. And secondly, we can only understand its permutation if we take seriously the question of global class struggle. Yeah, this is really helpful, Christina, because, you know, you show following Rigi and Silver that this is the most uh, turbulent uh, period of class struggle in the history of the capitalist uh, world system. And you make an argument about the economic geography of the system, but also the need to combine those methods with social history. And I wanted to ask you about this because you focus in on a range of what you term convergent spaces. Uh, these include uh, art collectives uh, from Mexico City to Harlem to Chicago, farm worker strikes on the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, radical educational spaces within a federal penitentiary in Leavenworth, uh, in Kansas, among many others. So, uh, and throughout, you really focus on the centrality, as you said before, of the making of internationalism. So can you explain these concepts? What are convergent spaces? And why do you focus so centrally on the process of making? Sure. 
Making, of course, is my hat tip to the long tradition of social history, uh, you know, most famously from E.P. Thompson's making of the English working class. My introduction to social history didn't go through Thompson. It actually started with C.L.R. James, with W.E.B. Du Bois, with the history of abolition. So, you know, uh, practitioners like Marcus Redeker sometimes reframe this as history from below, right? And Marcus actually, um, I, I got to know him uh, in England through uh, something I helped start called the Bristol Radical History Group, uh, where we did a lot of events around uh, abolitionist history. Um, and uh, so, you know, like the long and short of it is history from below says, how do you think about how people have made history, right? And not the people whose names are on buildings or whose personal papers are collected in archives. But as Marcus told me, the people who you have to trace uh, through welfare rolls and potter's fields, you know, in prison records, right? People whose names don't normally appear in the archive of, uh, you know, a, a official history, the history of the history of capital. So, you know, I thought it was really important to gesture towards uh, my debt to this history. This is essentially what I'm trying to do, social history in the book. So every chapter, as I said, is about the making of something. And where does this making take place? Well, as you mentioned, the big term for my uh, book, the big concept, is convergent space. And these are socio-spatial sites where disparate revolutionary and radical tradition converge and produce new articulations of struggle. So what do I mean? One example is Leavenworth uh, Federal Penitentiary, where uh, in the lead up to and after World War I, uh, you have every revolutionary in the world all confined in Kansas, right? So, you know, in the, um, a around the period of World War I, it became a federal crime, uh, you know, espionage, sedition, you know, crimes that are very much in the news today. Um, uh, and so it meant that people who were Bulgarian communists and Mexican revolutionaries and Indian nationalists and uh, you know, um, Mennonite pacifists all ended up being convicted of federal crimes and being put in this federal penitentiary. So I, uh, you know, I, I, I went to the National Archives, uh, you know, I, I looked through all these prison records and I just, my hair caught on fire. Uh, understanding not just the, the fact that these people were all in the same place, but that they were commiserating and collaborating. One uh, Department of uh, uh, Justice file called Leavenworth a university of radicalism because there was this consistent problem of people getting uh, incarcerated there and leaving as organizers, right? So uh, people were writing together, they were producing a newspaper together, and most interestingly, they actually had a university where they were teaching each other five nights a week. So, um, so this, uh, you know, I had to have some kind of language to be able to explain what did this mean, right? I mean, this is both a kind of unique circumstance, but I say it's also a kind of microcosm of revolutionary movements of the period, which intersected, you know, where, where people coming from different places and struggles were thrust together in chaotic ways uh, and had to try to find meaning together and had, had to try to figure out how to work together, how to strike together, how to organize together. So the concept I came up with was convergence space, uh, you know, as a way to articulate um, those kind of, I guess, making of new articulations. Well, let me ask you about one of those uh, convergent spaces. You have a chapter entitled, How to Make a University. And in that uh, chapter, you highlight the interventions of two incarcerated revolutionary intellectuals. The first, Mexican anarchist leader, Ricardo Flores Magón, who, uh, as you show, is incarcerated in Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary in Kansas. And interestingly, the second figure that you look at is uh, none other than Antonio Gramsci, the Italian Marxist theorist, who was himself incarcerated in uh, a fascist prison in Italy uh, in this same uh, moment, more or less. And 
So I wanted to ask you, why was it important to stage a dialogue between uh, these two figures? And what's the significance of their theories of alliances mm -hmm. and alliance building, particularly between the workers and the peasantry in this period? Let me say, first of all, that it would be impossible for uh, any scholar to think about Ricardo Flores Magón without the heroic work of Jacinto Barrera Basols, who passed away during uh, the COVID pandemic, I think in the second year. Um, so, you know, he was uh, both extraordinarily generous with me, but he also made uh, an extraordinary archive of Magón's writings available. And what's important about thinking about Magon and his writing is that he's always talking about the world, right? Uh, you know, he says Mexican workers, right? Kind of like the whole world is watching you. If you are able to overthrow, uh, you know, tyranny in Mexico, if you're able to defeat these foreign capitalists in Mexico, the whole world is watching, right? This is years before the Russian Revolution ever happened. And I think this global dimension of Magon's thought is really lost. You know, there's a lot of ways in which both Magon and the Mexican Revolution gets confined as a uh, nationalist struggle. When in fact, if you look at the writings of people like Magon, also Zapata, you have a sense of the way in which they're thinking about that struggle within, you know, transformations of the global world economy, which I'm happy to talk more about. But to your question, uh, you know, I, I thought it was important to just emphasize th this kind of, um, the global dimensions of Magon's radical thought by putting him in dialogue with his rough contemporary, uh, Antonio Gramsci. So, you know, Gramsci, I think, is incarcerated from 1926 on. You could correct me, I know you know. Uh, Magon is incarcerated a, a bit earlier. Um, uh, but they're both these revolutionaries that are writing from prison. They're both people who are thinking about uh, revolution, like the, the significance of education. What does it mean to develop intellectuals? This is, of course, a huge concept for Gramsci, right? Uh, you know, intellectuals, uh, traditional intellectuals, uh, you know, serve a function in society. They do different kinds of work to help reproduce a, a, a bourgeois order. And both these men are saying, well, the revolution needs its own intellectuals, right? Uh, so there's some interesting parallel writings that I feature in that chapter. But I, I, you know, to your question of alliances, I think this is something that I both wanted to emphasize on Magon's behalf, but also Gramsci. In the Southern Question, which is Gramsci's uh, unfinished essay, so interesting, before he is arrested, he's really thinking about this question of alliance building, right? Because at the time that he's organizing and writing, uh, and, 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 let me say this, you know, like both Magon and Gramsci have this really interesting relationship between both the peasantry and the industrial working class, right? Magon with the Partido Libertal, Liberal Mexicano, the PLM, is organizing, uh, helping to organize workers in Rio Blanco, in the, in the Southwest United States, in Orizaba, right? Uh, 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 Gramsci is working, uh, you know, is, uh, is working with, um, uh, industrial workers in Turin, in northern Italy, right? So both men are trying to think about how do you form alliances across uh, space with different sectors of workers who don't always appear to have common interests at heart, right? Particularly peasants and industrial workers, right? And this is a, a big question for Gramsci. And this isn't just a kind of theoretical, oh, wouldn't it be nice? Gramsci is from the South. Gramsci is from Sardinia. Gramsci sees that an alliance of Northern industrial capitalists and Southern landowners are producing an alliance and they're trying to seduce the peasants of Sardinia into that alliance with these appeals to nationalism. So Gramsci is trying to kind of work at both levels, right? He's both very attentive to the place that he's from, telling people, don't be seduced by these appeals. These are not your friends, right? But he's also going to Northern workers and saying, you need to check all these racist ideas you have about workers in the South, right? Because they are preventing you from entering into an alliance. And if you can't figure out how to make an alliance, fascism will win. And fascism did. Well, I mean, not without struggle, but this was what... Uh, uh, this is what occupied Gramsci in thinking about alliance building. And I think Magon's insights in, in a very similar period are very resonant with Gramsci's, right? 
uh, he's trying to think about how do you make alliances both within Mexico, across the working class and the peasantry, the industrial working class and the peasantry, but also globally, right? What does it mean for different parts of the world who also, you know, thinking again about Du Bois's color line, who also can't imagine themselves in solidarity because they don't see each other as humans, as equals, right? So both Gramsci and Magon are thinking about the particular poison of racism to impede the solidarity that's necessary, not only you know, for there to be any kind of victory, but to stop the onslaught of fascism. Yeah, they both understood that challenges to racism were absolutely necessary for resistance to class rule. And I want to ask you another question about Leavenworth, though, the alliances. You mentioned McGowan is thinking about alliances across Mexico, across uh, borders. He's organizing across the American Southwest, uh, you know, in Los Angeles, famously, uh, but also within the prison. I mean, this is a really interesting moment. Uh, after 1917, the Espionage Act, you've got this range and cast of characters uh, who are there. So can you talk a little bit about the alliance is being built uh, across the color line and across different political traditions in a site you call a university of radicalism. Sure. Um, well, I, I also want to give a shout out to Diego Flores Magón, uh, who is a descendant of Enrique Flores Magón, Ricardo's brother, who was also incarcerated with him in Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary. So what takes me to Leavenworth was that this is where Ricardo Flores Magón died, right? I mean, I think it should just bewilder anybody. How is it that this agitator, journalist, leader, organizer of the Mexican Revolution died in Kansas, right? Uh, and his final letters, which uh, are at the um, Amsterdam International Institute of Social History, are really heartbreaking, right? He's thinking about Mexico, the, the, the bluffs and the sun, while he's in this cold cell. He's his final words, I meant well, I meant well, my blonde brothers, but you could not understand me, right? So he's thinking about, uh, you know, a number of questions. Uh, so, you know, this whole world of what it meant uh, to put all these global radicals together in one place was really opened up for me through a number of archives, uh, you know, uh, uh, nationally and internationally. And what I found, as I think I started to, to mention earlier, was that these um, prisoners were organizing together. They were teaching each other. And this wasn't just because they had nothing better to do. This was because prison, federal prison, is an extraordinary, uh, an unconscionable state of confinement. Um, and so people, in order to protect themselves and the interests of the people around them, had to organize. And in the process of organizing, they realized that they had to also teach each other. Where were they coming from, right? What was the, you know, like, what was their understanding of the world? What was their understanding of power? What was their understanding of alliance? So the kind of universities uh, that develop where you have Mexican uh, wobblies, uh, Spanish uh, members of the industrial workers of the world, like Vicente Azuara, right? He was a journalist from Spain, teaching Spanish, uh, you know, to to his fellow prisoners. Uh, Enrique Flores Magón wrote a column in the paper that the prisoners wrote together called Mexican Kaleidoscope. And so every column is this fictionalized story about the Mexican Revolution because he's trying to teach the other prisoners what that's about, right? And, uh, you know, there's this incredible letter to President Harding that I think 52 of the incarcerated Wobblies write appealing for clemency. And, and you get this sense of like the effect this uh, education is having. They say, like the Mexican in the movie show, the IWW is always depicted as the villain. So, you know, one of the things I found in uh, Diego Flores Magón's archive was uh, Enrique's book collection. So you see the books that, uh, you know, the, not only Enrique read, but you can read in the in the uh, fly leaf, the inside cover, this note he's written to the other prisoners. Um, Louise Bryant, Six Red Months in Russia. Please do not write in this book and return it as soon as possible because there are many other people who are waiting to read this book and, you know, be nice to your fellow prisoners. So, you know, um, this is the, uh, the kind of um, education, organizing, this is the convergence um, that's happening. And 
you know, I mean, the, the thing that I'm, I'm not saying as much about, but just to say briefly, you know, like this was not all roses. There was, there was definitely like these extraordinary, there was a university, there was a newspaper, there was, you know, marches and strikes that were happening, but this was a, a, a heinous place of confinement. Um, and so the level of organizing was relative to the brutality that these prisoners faced. And uh, I do tell this story about, um, but I feel like it would just take too long to get into, but uh, you know, this, the, the prison of course has its own pedagogy that reproduces uh, different social relations, both you know, within and without. And so, uh, you know, prisoners had to confront, uh, you know, as I say at the end of the chapter, the color line, both within the walls of the prison and without. This was not an easy struggle. This continues to be a struggle. So this is something that I try to illustrate in that chapter. I really appreciate this. And the focus on uh, education and on pedagogy, the pedagogy of the prison, the pedagogy of the radical uh, prisoners, and this is a theme that you also take up in this extraordinary chapter called How to Make a Dress, which focuses on the story of Elizabeth Catlett, um, the radical artist whose uh, print is the cover uh, of Arise. And in that chapter, you make this intervention that there have been a range of studies that have focused on her biography, but not so much on her politics. And so I wanted to ask you about that. Why is that the case? And what changes when you shift the focus? I could talk about Elizabeth Catlett for weeks. Uh, so Mary Helen Washington wrote a, a fantastic book called The Other Blacklist. And the conclusion of it is actually a lot about this question. It's an interesting kind of uh, note of ambiguity to end a book about black radicals uh, who experienced their own blacklist. She, you know, she argues in the 30s and 40s. Um, so, you know, sometimes Catlett is just named as Charles White's one-time wife, which I won't do, and I, I, I regret repeating that. But uh, Mary Helen Washington asks at the end, like who is Elizabeth Catlett? You know, like, why does her name not, she's everywhere and she's nowhere. She's hiding in plain sight, right? She's like, uh, appears to be a fellow traveler of uh, all of these radical artists, Charles White, W.E. Du Bois, Paul Robeson, and yet, you know, there's no study about her. And uh, Washington cites Gwendolyn Midlow Hall, who says it's time to tell the truth about Elizabeth Catlett, this revolutionary. Uh, so I also want to give a shout out to Dr. Gwendolyn Midlow Hall, who recently passed, who was very generous with me in talking about Elizabeth Catlett, who was her friend in Mexico. Uh, Dr. Hall uh, was married to Harry Haywood, the Black Bolshevik, that's the name of his autobiography. And they, like a lot of radicals, spent time with Elizabeth Catlett in Mexico. Uh, Catlett's home in Cuernavaca was for a long time, you know, and also her previous home in Mexico City, was known as this kind of refuge for uh, black radicals uh, fleeing racism in the United States, some of the Black Panthers, uh, you know, later in the 20th century, but also people who were fighting against uh, fascism in Spain. There was this, uh, you could write a whole book about the convergent space of Elizabeth Catlett's uh, home in Mexico. Um, but uh, let me just kind of back up and say a little bit about who she was. So Elizabeth Catlett, uh, you know, was an extraordinary sculptor, printmaker, artist, um, and I would also say organizer in the process of recovering, uh, and, and teacher, and teacher. That was your question about pedagogy. So, uh, you know, Catlett says that she was a revolutionary from the time she was really young. She, when she was, a, she was born in Washington, D.C., when she was in high school, she put a lynch rope around her neck and stood in front of the Supreme Court to, to uh, protest lynching. She was at Dunbar High School. She was, you know, protesting even then. She got a little older and she was, a, um, you know, went to Howard. Uh, protested against uh, World War I with uh, um, other radicals in the period. She organized for better teacher pay when she was uh, working in North Carolina. She uh, taught at Dillard College and organized uh, to against segregation when her students were picked up uh, for 
protesting segregation. She organized the faculty to, to, to get the students out. She famously, kind of single-handedly, this is the story, desegregated the Delgado Museum of Art in New Orleans um, by just, uh, she was teaching art. She had all these black students. She's teaching at a historically black college, a university, Diller University, and a lot of these students had never gone to an art museum. So there was a traveling Picasso exhibit. This is around the time Guarnica uh, was painted. So she chartered a bus, drove it right up to the front of the museum and, and had all the students go in. And that moment desegregated that museum. And people who were present that day, Samela Lewis, right, credit that as the moment they decided to become artists. And that story even reverberated. So present day artists in New Orleans, like Willie Birch, say they were equally inspired just by that moment. So all this to say that, you know, Catlett was very firmly produced by a, a world in struggle against racism, against imperialism, against fascism. She finds herself in these radical centers in Chicago, the founding of the Southside Community Art Center. She's a key figure there. And she's around figures like Harry Haywood, like Gwendolyn Brooks, like Margaret Burroughs, you know, who are part of, um, what Brian Dolliner calls a black cultural front. In Harlem, and this is the kind of story I, I, I tell, she's a part of a number of different activities, uh, I, I think most meaningfully, at the Wa George Washington Carver School in Harlem. So um, this is, you know, the whole concept of naming every chapter, how to make, how to make, comes from the fact that at this school, it was a people's school in Harlem, uh, the most popular class. They taught music, they taught economics. You know, this was all volunteer run. The most popular class was a class that Elizabeth Catlett taught called How to Make a Dress, which is where the title comes from. And in this class, Catlett interacted with uh, the working class of Harlem, but mostly black domestic workers in Harlem that Marvell Cook and Ella Baker famously wrote about, right? And so in the process of making dresses, in the process of instructing the students how to make dresses, she's learning so much about the conditions of their labor, where they're living, you know, what it meant to have something that was uh, both um, presentable enough to be an object of conspicuous servitude for somebody who hired you for the day, but also something that was warm and flexible enough if you had to, you know, wait in the cold for somebody to hire you. Uh, so, um, there's a lot I could say about this, but I, uh, the, the argument that I make was that there's this extraordinary experience of radical pedagogy that Catlett develops through all these different experiences, which are kind of minimized. She moves to Mexico in 1946 and becomes a member of a group called the Taller de Grafica Popular, an internationalist art collective that's explicitly working with unions and student groups and you know left-wing movements uh, to be able to produce art. And some people start her story then. And so the chapter just kind of makes the gentle argument that like if you understand all these different things that she produced her, that she in turn produced before she gets to Mexico, you can then understand how she brought this, uh, you know, radical experience of pedagogy to the TGP and to the art that she produced, uh, produced there, including uh, the print that, yes, I'm very grateful is on the cover of my book. As well as this extraordinary series, The Black Woman, which you end the chapter with, and you make this really interesting uh, argument about how it's an intervention in debates about how internationalism is understood. And of course, you know, this is the major theme uh, for your book, A History of Internationalism. Also, your recent uh, essay in the Cambridge History of America and the World. Uh, on what you call the abolitionist international. And you've been offering a new periodization of the history of internationalism. As, as I said before, you connect the Mexican Revolution to the Haitian Revolution of 1791 and then uh, show uh, the importance uh, for the global revolutions of 1848. So can you talk about this uh, intervention? You know, a lot of my work has both been about thinking of the social history of revolution, but also the history of uh, policing and surveillance. So one of the things that I thought was so interesting was that the first use of aerial surveillance in the Americas was recorded uh, in the French colony of Saint-Domingue in the late uh, 18th century. 
uh, the device was a, a hot air balloon um, that was launched from the Galifat plantation. Uh, and, I, you know, there's this interesting story Peter Leinbaugh tells about how the French colonial passengers, you know, like, have this illusion of omniscience, this sense that, you know, there's a conquering air the same way they're conquering land and that they know all and can see all. The great irony is it's from the same Galifat plantation that the, the, the first insurrection of the Haitian Revolution happens. The Haitian rebels come out of that very same uh, plantation. And um, this is what sparks, you know, the Haitian Revolution, the first major slave revolution uh, in the modern world. Um, so, uh, you know, I try to tell a story about what it means from the perspective of people who are thinking about capitalism, uh, about revolution in the 19th century from the perspective of the Haitian Revolution. So I talk a lot about Frederick Douglass and what sort of sense he makes about this. Uh, and I describe something that's called the abolitionist international. What does it mean to think about the revolutionary currents that were inspired by Haiti? How different and rich is our imagination of internationalism when we start there? But I just want to say that, you know, on the other side of that, what's really interesting is that the concept of internationalism, a lot of people attribute it to Marx and Engels. Internationalism was actually conceived by Jeremy Bentham you know, famously the theorist of surveillance uh, who, who is credited with the idea of the panopticon. And I, uh, you know, and he comes up with this, he coins this term around the period of the Haitian Revolution. He's thinking about international jurisprudence. He's trying to think about what it means when uh, a country becomes a sovereign body after it achieves independence. But he's not thinking about Haiti. He's, uh, you know, his, his, Writings at the time are replete with all these racist colonial assumptions. But I, I talk about the kind of liberal internationalism that Bentham is trying to imagine and bring into being in the same period. So a lot of this chapter is this kind of conflict between an abolitionist international, how it develops over the 19th century and the vestiges of it in the early 20th against the liberal international, the kind of uh, uh, order of, of markets and finance that Bentham thinks is going to, uh, you know, liberate people in a different way, just not all people and just not most people. So um, I have a lot to say. This was a, a piece that I was really happy to present at a number of different kind of both scholarly and activist uh, venues. And, uh, you know, out of all the things I talked about, people were really intrigued by thinking about internationalism and surveillance together, you know, uh, at, 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 dialectically at once and against each other and what that meant at present, especially when so many social movements are trying to reckon with state violence and question of surveillance now. So, you know, I could say more, but also this is what I'm trying to write about in my next project, which is, you know, currently titled The Abolitionist International, so everybody will have to stay tuned. Well, let me ask you about uh, this because, uh, you know, one of the things I really wanted to invite you to say more about it is what are the lessons uh, from your research for scholars and activists in our own time? And how might your work on the long history of internationalism help us in understanding the present moment? Right. Um well, that's what it's all about, right? I mean, if we are in a revolutionary tradition, if we see ourselves in that tradition, if we're inspired by, the, by that tradition, it means that, as Cabral said, you know, tell no lies, claim no easy victories, right? And, and don't rest on truths that were developed in earlier moments, right? So part of the task is to create intellectuals who can continue to rigorously uh, interrogate the present, learn from past uh, moments, but not just kind of displace, transpose the lessons from one era onto another. So a lot of it is highlighting how did people in chaotic situations make internationalism? How did they make revolution? Not how were their circumstances easily slotted into a formula for revolution. And I think that this task is more urgent than ever. I would just say, you know, like I've, I've talked a lot, so I'll just kind of break it down into kind of the two shorthands of I see like gathering storms. 
on the one hand, there is a gathering storm of what I would call, and actually what some people on the far right call a dark international. The uh, alignment, unsteady, but alignment of far right forces uh, nationally and internationally who see their interests um, you know, align. And this is white nationalists. This is also, you know, I mean, in India, you see a, a, a number of nationalists there who see their interests aligned who wouldn't identify as white nationalists. Um, but there's a, just a very threatening trend of these uh, interests coalescing, seizing different forms of power, uh, gaining electoral office, and gaining increasing legitimacy. And so anybody who doesn't want that, has to figure out a new kind of language and logic through which we can unify. I would say the other gathering storm is the actual gathering storm of the climate crisis. I mean, at this moment, you've got half a million people displaced from flooding in Pakistan. Afghanistan has undergone major flooding. The eastern Kentucky is still underwater. Uh, you know, you have wildfires in places like uh, France, you have enormous drought uh, in Germany, in China. Um, so, you know, in Jackson, Mississippi, right? So, you know, these things are not unrelated. The climate crisis in one area helps produce climate crisis in another. And as we all know, the kind of um, uprooting and dispossession that will continue to happen as a result of these developments will produce the future world. Our question is how will we respond? We need something as big and unifying as the threats to us. And so we need to develop a language to be able to confront it. And this is, if, if it was self-evident, if it's easy, we do it already. But I believe that, you know, emboldened by the history of global radicals who have tried to figure out how to make meaning under incredible odds, uh, and inspired by the work that people are doing around the country, around the world, to fight back, to feel like this is not the world that they're, uh, you know, uh, this is not the world they want, that they want something better. I believe that can happen. Yeah, thanks, Christina. You know, this uh, really resonates and reminds me of, of Stuart Hall's uh, injunction to be disciplined by uh, conjuncture. And so, but I wanted to ask if there's anything that I haven't asked that you'd like to add. I feel like I just told you my whole life story. Um, I'll just share one thing that I feel like I've learned from doing this work, uh, which is, you know, the history of social change is full of people who made a way out of no way, you know, it's full of people who had to be extremely creative and resourceful to try to figure out how to produce the conditions in which they could do the work to think through their moment, to approach and confront their moment and make alliances with other people. This is never a given. This is never easy. This is something we have to continue to fight to make possible. Uh, and it's a struggle. But those who make the kind of radical questioning of the present impossible make violent reaction inevitable. So this is a kind of all hands on deck moment. That's what I'd say. Well, uh, thank you so much, Christina, for sitting down with me for this episode of Conjuncture. Congratulations on the publication of uh, Arise. I hope there'll be other opportunities for us to sit down and, and speak together again. And I also want to thank our viewers and listeners for joining us for this episode of Conjuncture. Please stay tuned for upcoming episodes with Isaac Kamola, Tulani Davis, and more.